All right, so now the plane has just crashed. Lucas and Uncle Benny just watched the first plane crash into the tower. So let's see what happens in chapter seven. It looks like tower one, Uncle Benny was saying, his phone pressed to his ear as he and Lucas ran back into the firehouse. The North Tower, no, no, not a small plane. It was a jet, a big jet. Yes, I'm sure, Uncle Benny was shouting out. I saw it with my own eyes. Lucas kept glancing back, each time hoping that the tower would magically be healed. But each time he looked, there was more and more black smoke. The sound of sirens filled the air. Get ready, Uncle Benny was saying. We're going to need everything we have. There has to be at least ten floors on fire. Ten floors on fire. Dad had told Lucas that every floor of the Twin Towers was about the size of a football field. Dad had told Lucas that every floor of the Twin Towers was about the size of a football field. Lucas tried to imagine what ten football fields would look like, each one on fire. How many firefighters would it take to put the fires out? And what if each of those fires was almost a quarter of a mile in the air? That's how high the towers were. Lucas knew how much firefighters hated high-rise buildings. Elevators were usually too dangerous to use in a fire. They could stop working suddenly and fill with smoke. But the only other choice was to lug heavy hoses and 50 pounds of gear up endless flights of stairs. Georgie once told Lucas that it could take two minutes for a firefighter to walk up just one flight of stairs. Lucas looked back at the tower. That fire was near the top, maybe the 18th or 19th floor. That meant it could be two hours before the firefighters could get there. Could the people on those floors wait that long for help? The Seagrave was already out of the garage when Lucas and Uncle Benny got back to the firehouse. Georgie was at the wheel. Men from both shifts were piled on. Benny ran over to grab his turnout clothes and helmet. Lucas followed after him. Uncle Benny, he said, what will you do? Uncle Benny stepped in his bunker pants and boots. We'll do what we always do, he said. He put his hand on Lucas's head for a moment. Then he ran to the truck. Chief Douglas called out to Lucas from the truck. Your dad is heading to the scene. You sit tight. Take the care of things for us, buddy, Uncle Benny said. The truck pulled away, its siren wailing. The garage door shut. And Lucas stood there in shock, alone. He ran to the phone and called Mom. But she didn't answer. He left a message, struggling to keep his voice from cracking that he was at the firehouse, that he was fine, and that she should call him. He hung up and stood there, his mind spinning. Uncle Benny's words whispered in his head, We'll do what we always do. What they always did. Fight fires and save people's lives. Yes, that's what they would do now. The fire department of New York was the biggest fire department in the world, and they were the best, and they would do what they always did. Chapter 8, 9 o'clock a.m. Dad once told Lucas that what he liked most about fighting fires was that everyone had a job to do. If you don't work together, you don't put out the fire. Now Lucas looked around the firehouse. He needed a job, he realized, something he could do to help. He went into the kitchen. The table was covered with plates of half-eaten bacon and eggs. The sink was overflowing with dirty pots. So he got to work cleaning the dishes and glasses from clearing the dishes and glasses from the table. Every few minutes the alarm box squawked and the dispatcher came on with a new alarm. All units meet at Vessie and West Street. The TV was on the counter, the sound turned down. The picture on the screen showed the burning tower. Lucas reached out and turned the volume up so he could hear hear it over the voice of the dispatcher. If you're just joining us, ladies and gentlemen, the TV man's voice said, you're looking at an extraordinary sight. Just a few minutes ago, a plane crashed into Tower 1 at New York's famed World Trade Center. We have no official information about what kind of plane it was, but eyewitnesses report it was a commercial jet. Lucas picked up Georgie's huge cast iron skillet and started scrubbing. The towers were built in 1970, the man continued. 
At 110 floors each, there were once the tallest buildings in the world. There are hundreds of firefighters on the scene. We have reports that firefighters have been entering the building and heading up the stairs to reach people who might need assistance. It's an amazing sight. The smoke was thicker now, painting the sky a dirty brown. There were white dots floating in the smoke, almost like confetti. Paper, Lucas realized. Millions of pieces of paper swept out through the hole in the building. The man kept talking about the towers, that they took four years to build, that they could withstand winds of 140 miles per hour, that 50,000 people worked there. His voice was calm, almost like a teacher giving a history lesson. Lucas was reaching up to hang the heavy skillet on the hook over the sink. Suddenly, the man on TV gasped. Oh my, what was that? Another explosion? Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like a second plane. Yes, another jet. It has just crashed into the second tower. The heavy skillet slipped out of Lucas's hand and into the sink, shattering the plates and glasses. Lucas barely noticed. His eyes didn't move from the TV screen. Ladies and gentlemen, the man said again, his voice shaking. We are going to replay the video of what we just saw. The screen flipped. It showed the North Tower burning, and then suddenly, on the left side of the screen, another plane appeared, just like the first. It was a big jet, and quick as a blink, it slammed into the other tower, exploding into a fireball. Fire erupted out of all sides of the building, a ring of flaming blackness. Now there were two clouds of churning black smoke. Lucas's heart pounded. It was hard to breathe. There were more people talking on TV now, not just the man. Oh my, oh my, that looked, one woman said. What did we just see, said another. Ladies and gentlemen, the man said, we have just witnessed the horrific sight of a second plane hitting the other tower, the South Tower. There was a massive explosion. There must have been a computer problem, a complete failure of the... Air traffic control system, said the first woman. What the man said next made Lucas's entire body start to shake. That did not look like an accident, he said. It looks like that plane flew into the tower on purpose. I think this is some kind of attack. Chapter 9. Lucas tried calling Mom again. Now, when he called, he got a fast busy signal and a recording. All circuits are busy. He tried Dad's phone. Same thing. He dialed over and over, Mom, Dad, Mom, Dad. He just kept getting the busy signal. The department radio crackled. Recall, recall, the dispatcher said. All personnel on duty and off are to report. I repeat, this is a recall of all emergency personnel. There were 11,000 firefighters in the department. They needed every single one. Before Lucas knew what he was doing, he had run out into the street. He couldn't be alone watching the world fall apart on TV. He needed to find Dad and Uncle Benny and the rest of the men. He wanted to be with them. He knew he wasn't thinking clearly. He didn't even know if he'd be able to get close to where they were or if it was safe to try, but he went anyway. Some kind of attack. Some kind of attack. Was that man on TV right? What did that even mean? Who was attacking? Did he mean that those planes had hit the towers on purpose? That thought hadn't even come into Lucas's mind when he saw the first plane hit. But thinking about it now, of course, that was the only thing that made sense. The day was so perfectly clear. There was no way that two airplanes could have hit the towers unless they had been aiming right for them. But who could be insane enough evil enough to fly planes into buildings. Lucas wiped away the tears running down his face. He wove through the crowds of people on the sidewalk. Some were running north, but most seemed like they were in shock, standing there dazed, staring at the fires above them. The only noise was sirens, hundreds of them honking and screaming, wailing and shrieking and blaring. The sounds all crashed together into one terrible song. A crowd of people huddled around something in the middle of the street. Lucas slowed down and looked. 
It was a big tire attached to a tangle of metal. It didn't look like the tire of a car or truck. What is that? A woman said. It's part of the plane, a man said. It's the landing gear. Lucas looked away. He pushed through the crowd heading south. Bessie and West Streets. That's where the staging area was, where the firefighters were gathering. If Dad had made it here from Randall's Island, that's where Lucas would find him. He would look for the sea grave. He would wait there for Dad. Lucas inched through the crowd. Most people were standing still, watching. But now there were more people coming from the direction of the towers. Some of them were soaked in sweat, their clothes tattered. But it was the looks on their faces, stunned and horrified, that told Lucas where they had come from, inside the towers. There were dozens and dozens of them, some walking alone, others holding hands. Some of the women were barefoot. He imagined their high heel shoes kicked into the corners of the stairwells. Nobody was carrying a purse or a briefcase, and Lucas understood why. He had heard many stories about people who had survived fires and explosions and collapses. So many times they'd escaped with not a second to spare. If they had stopped for anything, to grab a purse or their shoe or tie their shoes, they wouldn't have made it. A policeman up ahead was trying to stop people from moving south. Everyone, please leave this area, he shouted. It's not safe. Please leave this area and head north. But Lucas kept walking, and nobody tried to stop him. He felt invisible. Ladder 177 had been one of the first units to get to the towers. That meant they'd be the closest. Lucas was still three blocks away when he felt a hand on his shoulder. Hey, a young policeman said. Where are you going? Are you lost? I need to find... And before he could get the words out, he heard someone calling his name. Lucas! His dad rose up above all the sirens. Dad! And there was his dad pushing through the crowd. He grabbed Lucas and held him tight. For a few seconds, Lucas couldn't hear the sirens. All he could hear was the beating of Dad's heart. All right, we're going to stop there and we'll finish what happened next time.